I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not a Pipe. Thank you very much for joining me today. I'm thrilled to be speaking with Lawrence Grossberg about his book, Under the Cover of Chaos, Trump and the Battle for the American Right. I first met Larry the year that Stuart Hall died, which was not a very good year in many ways, Uh, but I encountered him at a Cultural Studies Association conference. He was giving a talk about his experience having worked with Stuart Hall so closely over the years. I thought it was a really great thing to be a part of. I was very happy when I got to talk to him again this year at the Cultural Studies Association. I asked Larry if he would be on the podcast and he graciously accepted. And you know, he really doesn't have to do these kinds of things, but it speaks very much to his character and his generosity as a public intellectual. Larry is currently Morris Davis Distinguished Professor of Communication and Cultural Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I could go on and on about his accomplishments. I just learned this week that his book has won the National Communication Association's 2019 Diamond Anniversary Book Award. I think what's likely is that you already know who Larry Grossberg is and he needs no introduction, or perhaps you're listening to this and you're not familiar with his work, in which case, in addition to Under the Cover of Chaos, I recommend you check out a lot of the work he's done. Particularly this summer I was reading Cultural Studies 1983, which is Stuart Hall's Lectures in Chicago, which is edited by Larry, as well as Jennifer Darrell Slack. A really great introduction to cultural studies. He's done so much. I won't speak any more about that. I'll let the interview speak for itself. Thank you so much, Larry, for speaking with me today. I thought maybe we could begin with the context of your book, the 2016 election victory of Trump. This book really lays out a sober account of what the right has been up to and how this came to be. Let's talk about how you were able to make sense of this mess. Well, you know, I've been writing for a long time about popular culture and political culture, and especially about the rise of the new right and various conservative alliances. I was not surprised by Trump's victory. I was not surprised by the panic and vitriolic response that the left had to that uh, victory. Mm -hmm. Although I was disappointed in it because I've always thought that it's my job as a political intellectual to try to understand events that happen in the complex contexts that enable us to make sense of them and perhaps formulate better strategies. Surprisingly, although there's been a lot of good literature on particular elements of the current political situation, especially on the rise of the reactionary right, I don't think the progressive, liberal, left forces, whatever one wants to call them, have a good understanding of what's going on. You know, one of my favorite slogans, I I think I use it in the book, is bad stories make bad politics. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to try to begin to tell at least a part. I don't by any means want to claim that the book gives a full and robust account of all the forces that have determined the current political situation. But I wanted at least to give an account of part of what I thought was going on in order to try to make sense of it in ways that might push the left into thinking more long term, more strategically, and in terms of developing what Stuart Hall used to call a popular politics. So that's what I tried to do. For some reason, the right seems to be much better at telling a sort of unifying story or narrative that gets a lot of people behind it. And one of the most interesting things to me, at least about your book, was the way that you highlight the fact that the right is not a monolith by any stretch of the imagination. There are lots of very different groups within that. But somehow the right in general, or the Republican Party in the U.S., was able to get a lot of these groups together by telling arguably good stories, at least good stories in the sense of getting people behind them. Why is the left not very good at this? Well, I think there are lots of reasons. One of them is that the left has never been very good dealing with popular culture. I think the left often has a serious 
mistrust of popular culture and while there are younger scholars and, and there are always some scholars who do an admirable job on the left talking about popular culture, we tend to think that our job is to criticize it rather than to understand how and why it's speaking to people. I think it's also the case that the right, you know, there's a kind of continuity and discontinuity over the past 50 years starting with the emergence uh, in the 1960s of a new conservatism, of what we came to call the new right. And then a lot of their strategies and arguments and positions continue today. And some of Trump is rooted in that tradition. But there was some kind of break with the emergence of a much more reactionary formation. But the right has, over the years, understood a number of things that the left, I think, has not. One is changing the political culture of a society is a long-term project that takes work on lots of different fronts and with lots of different constituencies that you have to address in different ways. I think the left operates with the same kind of short-term mentality too often that it attributes to contemporary capitalism. We want the world and we want it now. I don't think that's how political cultures change. Secondly, I think the right understood that this long-term project was going to demand that they think both tactically and strategically. And that meant that they had to forge uncomfortable alliances. I mean, we don't talk enough about how the right succeeded, for example, in Reagan and Bush in bringing together religious fundamentalists and Chicago economists, mm -hmm. and how they could sit at the same table without killing each other. <laughs> but they did, and they understood that there was a kind of compromise that they could make to get them, as it were, to first base, and then they worry about how to get to second base. Mm. Forgive the sports metaphors. <laughs> you know, one of the metaphors I use in the book, which I take from one of the leaders of the New Right, was hitchhiking. Mm. You know, if you want to go to California, you got to get to Chicago first. So you take a ride with whomever is going to get you to Chicago. You don't worry that they don't want to get to California. You figure out the next step after you get there. And the right has been much more active in forging the kind of alliances and compromises. The left is terrible at that. You know, the left consistently renounces the idea that there can be some kind of unity. I mean, the one advantage, I suppose, that Trump has introduced into left politics is that he's given a sense of unity. Mm -hmm. We all want to defeat Trump. The fact that defeating Trump is not even, I think, a major step in the kind of battles that we need to fight if we want to change American political culture in the ways that we presumably want. To. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, Eve Sedgwick, one of the founders, I suppose, of queer theory, she has this great line where she says the left needs to stop telling people what they should feel and start listening to what they do feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. The right has understood that much better than the left. I mean that in two ways. Stuart Hall, my teacher, used to say if you want to organize political change, you have to start where people are. You can't sort of demand that they be where you are. You have to go to where they are in order to move them to a better position, hopefully, in the directions that you want. I think the right has been much more successful at doing that, at addressing people where they are, at addressing their real hopes, but also even more with Trump, their real fears, mm -hmm. picking up on implicit and sometimes explicit anger and hatred that has always been simmering below the surface of America in a variety of ways, you know, picking up on these and addressing them, trying to connect them to politics. There is no real reason why, to use a, you know, an example lots of people have talked about, there's no reason why the anger and even rage of white working class Americans, or at least some, because I don't think Trump won the majority of white working class Americans, mm -hmm. but he won a significant part. There's no reason that the anger they felt 
in their situation was going to be connected to a conservative or reactionary political position. But I think the right understood that it could be, understood that if they did the work, some of it intentional and some of it evil, in my opinion, they could win people to a new political position. And I think the second part of it is, and you know, this is an argument that I've been making since I first wrote about Reagan and rock and roll, is I think the right understands better than the left and has come to terms with it in ways that the left has not, and, and I have to admit, in ways that I have not quite figured out. The complex mix that defines politics and political struggle today, and that mix is a mix of policy, but that's becoming less and less important, ideology, but that's always contradictory. Mm -hmm. One of the things we know is people can hold ideological positions, but not vote with their own ideologies. I mean, that was one of the things I think we discovered well, Stuart Hall wrote about it and others in England with Thatcher. I tried to write about it with Reagan. And a lot of the people who voted for Reagan, and I think it still holds true, were ideologically a lot more liberal than the presidential candidate they voted for. Mm -hmm. So the mix is policy, ideology, and then what I call affect, or if you want, you could call it feeling. Mm -hmm emotion, moods, all sorts of ways in which people live their lives in dimensions beyond the rational questions of policy and the ideological questions of belief, but the political questions of feeling, of what matters to them. You know, to give one example, the left today is very, a lot of people are very concerned with the fact that Trump lies. Mm -hmm. First of all, in the 60s, we were saying all politicians lie. Reagan lied. Bush, too, told incredible lies. He got us into a war mm -hmm. by lying. Right? But we're upset that people aren't upset by his lies. And we end up, it seems to me, I've read too many people who seem to assume that these people are uneducated or their religious fervor trumps. Sorry for the... <laughs> Uh, trumps their commitment to the truth, yeah. or the media and capitalism have enabled this, or these people are too stupid or evil to know the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is, why don't they care? It's not a question of whether they know the truth or not. It's that they don't care about whether or not he's telling the truth. It doesn't matter to them. It's not what is important. The polls today suggest that a great majority of Americans believe in climate change. Mm -hmm. And the great majority believe that this is a potential catastrophe. But there is no evidence that they are going to vote on that issue. It doesn't matter in a certain way to them. And I think the right has been very good in understanding the complexity of taking issues, ideologies, policies, and connecting them up to how people feel and what matters to them and their emotional states and their fears and hopes and putting them all together in order to move people into a certain political position or at least part of a political position because one of the mistakes that I think the left often makes is that it treats people as if they were kind of simple. And they have a political position. Mm -hmm. And almost everyone I've ever talked to, and if you read contemporary theory, you know, cultural theory, this should be obvious to everyone. People are fragmented, contradictory articulations of a variety of positions, you know, which don't fit together, but nevertheless, they occupy them. And in one moment, they'll occupy one particular element of that position. And in another moment, they'll occupy a different. Yeah. The right has been very good in developing a politics that is addressed to that complexity. I think the left falls back into politics that are built on simplicities. It's all about the media. It's all about capitalism. It's all about racism. That is an inherent part of America. And my theory is always it's never all about anything. Yeah. It's always about the ways in which complex contradictory structures, practices, feelings, ideas are put together 
and address in order to bring people into a political position that you want them to be in. There's so much I want to talk to you about in regards to what you've just said and unpacking. You started with popular culture, and I want to ask you about that first. It seems to me, at least, like if you listen to dominant popular discourses of the left or the right, on some level, it seems like conservatives and the right do not see themselves in popular culture. They see popular culture as a as a media elite, leftist, almost conspiracy, depending on who you think of or who you listen to. Right. And yet you're talking about it in the sense that it actually does the work for the right or in bringing people or their messages together. How is it that both groups disassociate themselves with popular culture? While obviously, I mean, by numbers, they both flock to popular culture, use popular culture, obviously get gratifications from popular culture, but often see the, see it as a problem that is indicative of sort of the other side. Right. The left often thinks of popular culture as kind of forbidden fruit, pleasures that we're not supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because I think the left tends to see things. And again, I don't mean every all the left or all left intellectuals, but I think the overall thrust is that it does not, despite its roots, some roots in Marx, it doesn't really accept contradiction. It doesn't understand that everything in the world that I've ever seen that might take us one step forward also takes us one step back. Popular culture might, I mean, my wife and I were just talking the other night about this. Now, the number of images of gay and interracial couples, the number of images of differentially abled people, all of this is proliferating. This is why the right thinks that popular culture is always liberal, because in terms of what they see as kind of identity politics, the media are much more toward the left than they are on the right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, most people I know who talk about this will say, oh, look, that's wonderful. There's an image of a gay couple, but... And then they'll tell you what's wrong. With mm -hmm. Now, that's fine. I don't object to people saying, yes, but I believe that. But it's often said in a way so that the but overrides the yes. Hmm. And we end up rejecting what we should see as a step forward and then taking that to move forward. I think the right has always understood that culture is more important than the left has. Mm -hmm. The work I do in cultural studies partly emerged out of an argument in England, but also in Mexico and in, in China, all over the world after the Second World War, where left intellectuals began to say, actually, culture matters here. It's not just a kind of secondary phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think the right has always understood that. You know, when Breitbart starts in 2007 or 8, one of the headlines, as it were, on their website said, politics is downstream from culture. Had to change the culture if you wanted to change the politics. They understood that. People are often not aware, for example, that Steve Bannon's roots were in the media industries. Mm -hmm. He was deeply involved with making films, producing films with filmmakers. That's where his roots come from. But he's a maverick or an outsider, right? <laughs> well, he was a conservative in the media industry, mm -hmm. but he also worked on mainstream projects. Yeah, but I mean, somehow they can disassociate themselves, a lot of the right, from the media by saying, like, it amazes me that Fox News will say, for example, uh, we are the number one newscast in the nation or something, and then they will talk about the media as if it wasn't them. It's even more amazing that Fox, as a network, will have this incredibly conservative news organization, mm -hmm. and then have The Simpsons. Yeah which is as big a contradiction as one could think of. And that, of course, is part of the complexity. They're in it for the money in part. I mean, they're always negotiating the relations between politics, economics, and culture. The left treated the culture war, culture wars, as a kind of secondary phenomenon to the political battles. Uh, whereas I think the right took the culture wars as the primary site of struggle. Hmm because they had to change the culture. They probably understood that they were not going to change the culture of Hollywood. Although Bannon made some conservative movies, you know, and there's always Mel Gibson and people who have tried to 
open the cracks in Hollywood to a conservative thing. Mm -hmm. I think they understood that they weren't going to do it in the Hollywood movie industry. They've done more of it on television and have always had, since cable, a real popular presence on television, which the left generally tends to dismiss. You know, when we write about it, uh, we write in incredibly derogatory negative terms with an occasional exception. But, you know, part of the brilliance of the reactionary right was that it incorporated into its mix people who understood how the media were changing, partly, of course, with Trump in reality television mm -hmm. and partly with Milos and others, you know, the so-called alt-right, with people who understood social media. They have used that quite effectively in ways the left has never been able to do. The left has never been able to kind of mount uh, something like an answer to Rush Limbaugh. Mm -hmm. It has good liberal TV shows, but it can find a way to kind of keep them going into more complex progressive scenarios. And I think, again, this comes back to something I said earlier, which is that I think what makes popular culture popular? I've always argued this. A lot of my friends disagree with me. That's okay. I've always argued that popular culture works because it is affective. Mm -hmm. It works on feeling. It's not about ideology. You know, I started my early work, actually, the first thing I wrote, or tried to write, was about the role of popular music in the counterculture in the 60s. And I wanted to know why it was so important. Working on popular music convinced me that you can't understand popular music if you think it's about ideology. I mean, if you think it's about the message, mm. uh, you're missing the point. It isn't to say the words don't matter. It's to say the way they matter is how they connect up to emotions, feelings, moods, etc. When MTV was started, the founder, Pittman, uh, when asked what it was, he said it's a mood enhancer. Mm. Popular music is that, and I, I want to generalize that a bit and say I think what makes popular culture popular is not the content or the size of the audience. We know a lot of popular culture can have a very small audience. Mm -hmm. It's about the way one relates to it, not at the level of meaning or at the level of ideology. We relate to it at the level of the politics of feeling. And I think the right has understood that that's how media works. That's what Rush Limbaugh is all about. Yeah. I mean, that's what reality TV is all about. And that's what social media is all about. I think the right has, whether consciously, there are smart people on the right, you know, to what extent they know what they're doing. I think they have much more effectively than the left utilized and managed and orchestrated, or at least tried to, the affective impact of popular culture and media. And I want to ask you as well, then, in the book, you map out the sort of conjuncture of a number of different things in the cultural studies way of looking at not just, as you said, one thing being the cause or another thing being the cause, but a number of things that came together that have been building up, but are also sort of new. I'm curious about how you think about that. And if you can say a little bit about the changes in terms of the effective landscape, in terms of the media landscape, and in terms of everything that we've been seeing, because on some level, it's tempting to say, well, it's Facebook or Twitter's fault, or it's reality TV's fault, or whatever the case. Trump is completely new, and he's changing the landscape of politics. But as you sort of mentioned, I mean, Reagan was in Hollywood, he lied, Bush did not tell the truth. But it also does feel like something qualitatively different. How do you negotiate seeing these things as a continuation and seeing them as a sort of new or significantly different phenomenon? Yes. I mean, I think that's that's the big question. You know, the kind of work I do, the key question is always what's old, what's new, and what happens to the old when it's combined in a context with the new? Because that's going to change it. You know, racism is not new mm -hmm. in the United States. On the other hand, I don't think that you can understand the contemporary forms, and I think there are a whole range of different forms of racism operating in America today. 
I don't think you can understand them as simply the same old, same old thing. Mm -hmm. You have to look at how they are put in relation with other elements, cultural, political, social, in order to operate somewhat differently. I think a great deal about Trump is old, or at least it goes back to the new right. I think a lot of his policies, cutting taxes for the wealthy, patriotism, not perhaps the kind of rabid nationalist version, the anti-globalist version that Trump is and his supporters have put forth. But, you know, mm -hmm. America, love it or leave it, was a popular slogan on the right in the 60s and 70s. These kind of appeals are not new. It doesn't mean they haven't changed in the current context. But you have to look and go back. Many of Trump's policies and many of his behavior are things that were developed over the past 50 years. Whether they were intentional or not, I don't really know because I don't study at that level mm -hmm. that kind of historical detail. Although there are some who have, and you know, some of the studies of Nixon's success and, and Goldwater's campaign and Reagan's success do suggest they knew what they were doing more than we give them credit for. You know, we treated Reagan, we treated Bush, and we treat Trump too often as if they're idiots. I have no idea whether they are or not, but I don't think that it's a good strategy to assume your opponent is an idiot, uh, especially if they're winning. Mm. You know, there are smart people at work, new right, the new conservatism, of late 20th century, and now in the reactionary right. What is new? You know, to be honest, I can't claim that I keep up as much as I should with the media landscape. I don't do social media. You know, I'd like to just claim I'm too old, but I don't quite know how to deal with it. I leave that to my some students and other people. But something did happen. The new right, one of the things it did very effectively, again, that the left did not do, successfully, was that it managed the relationship between, on the one hand, state politics and movement politics, and on the other hand, between those movement politics that it thought it could bring into the mainstream, anti-abortion, homophobia, uh, all sorts of politics that it could champion, states' rights, gun rights, mm -hmm. that it thought it could bring into the popular imagination and popular discourses and common sense. But it also excluded those movements that it thought were too extreme. So although, starting with Nixon, there was a kind of dog whistle racism about conservative politics, mm -hmm. it also excluded from the stage of the Republican Party to a large extent the kind of white supremacism and white nationalism that we see today. You know, although Reagan said the Republican Party and conservatism were umbrella organizations, they did not let groups like the John Birch Society and the Ku Klux Klan into the inner circle, kept them marginal. The left has not been very good at doing that either way. And, and I'm not saying, you know, that that's the right strategy. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying this is what the Republicans have done, and we need to understand how they have built the success that they have, even to the extent that, you know, given the disaster that is Trump as a president, I'm hearing more and more people coming out with predictions that say Trump could win. Mm -hmm. And you have to stop and think, my God, how is this possible? <laughs> and it seems to me the left has no idea how it's possible. Yeah. So we need to understand how it's possible. The left has not been good at managing the relation between movement and state politics. You know, in 1968, when SDS and other groups, a large part of the movement left, refused to support the Democratic Party and abandoned it because Humphrey refused to promise to get out of Vietnam. And it didn't come back in, really, until Obama. And it's never been very good at saying look, you know, in theory, we might agree with your politics, 
but we don't see a way to articulate it into a popular politics that will speak to Americans, a majority of Americans. I'm not saying that that's good or bad. Yeah. I'm just saying that doesn't seem aware of it. And, you know, I, I often find it odd that in the name of democracy, the left can be very elitist and closed-minded. Right? Yeah. We think that you're part of the community as long as you agree with us. You know, participatory democracy is too often an ideal, which in practice turns into, as long as you agree with us, you can participate in democracy. Yeah. But if you don't agree, we aren't going to do the work of winning you into the position because we've already decided you're evil, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're duped by the media, but we're not. Mm -hmm. I think part of the dilemma happens because beginning with the new millennium, something begins to change. And, you know, some people have referred to it as postmodernism. Mm -hmm. Something in the affective landscape, as I call it, begins to change into more structures of irony and cynicism that come to dominate not only popular culture, but people's relationship to political institutions and political possibilities. But I do agree with what many people have said. All hell breaks loose in 2007 and 2008. It breaks loose not only because of the financial crisis, mm -hmm. which of course devastated enormous numbers of working class Americans, and not only because of the horrific way in which Obama responded to that crisis, which was to prop up the banks. But even when he made the right gesture of saying, okay, let's help the people whose homes are now underwater, yeah. he didn't say it in a way to address the people who say, and I've been trying to work through this, it's not that I agree with it. I always have to be careful, but I think we have to think about it because I talk to people who have said this to me. He's bailing out people who acted irresponsibly. I have acted responsibly. I have paid my mortgage. You know, I've done everything I'm supposed to do that they told me to do as a good American citizen. Yeah. And the government is bailing out those people. My neighbors, I, I live in the middle of rural Carolina, mm -hmm. and some of my, most of my neighbors are Trump supporters. And their response to the notion that we're going to forgive the debt of college students is why are you giving this benefit yeah. to the middle, mainly middle class and we're screwed. Now, again, I don't know the answers, but I know that if we want to reach people, we have to start where they are. We have to take their feelings seriously and we have to ask, what can we do to move them? In some cases, we may not be able to move them. You know, we may never win 100%. We may never yeah. even win 70% of the American population. But you combine that financial crisis with the election of Obama and the fact, of course, that the choice was between a woman and a black man, which obviously did speak to racism. I don't know how anyone growing up in the United States cannot be impacted in some ways mm -hmm. by the racism of a country. They also learned strategies to ignore it, though. Yes. you learn, And you learn strategies to repress it. Mm -hmm. I'm a great admirer of the civil rights movement, but the failure of the civil rights movement, as of much left politics, is to think that when we win the victory, the battle is over. Mm -hmm. You know, discrimination is illegal. Racism doesn't get answered. It gets repressed. Yeah. But right? you cannot speak your racism in public. A series of events happen. Obama's election is one of them. Uh, you know, O.J. Simpson is arrested again and found guilty the second time, which, of course, legitimated people's argument that actually he was guilty the first time, mm. but he got off. You know, all these kinds of things enter in. Lots of things happen. It's interesting in that two-year period. Breitbart News starts. The iPhone is introduced. All sorts of things happen at that moment that I think create the 
conditions, the environment in which the reactionary right, those groups that had largely been kept on the margins by the new right, mm. which I don't mean to make the new right sound good. They were using appeals to racism and homophobia and their policies. Yeah. You know, they were not something I'm fond of, but these groups were the marginalized groups. Yeah. And in that moment, they came onto the national stage in a different way, not as something to be ashamed of, but as something that expressed the deeper feelings of a significant segment of the American population. Yeah. And I think that changed everything. And combined with, you know, the new affordances of iPhone. Uh, in that year, Nancy Pelosi becomes the first female speaker of the House. You know, all sorts of things are happening that combine, that enable a re-articulation, a reconfiguration, and a new forms of expression of feelings that have been either suppressed or marginalized. Mm -hmm. And they come through politics that are, you know, from my point of view, and from many, you know, from everyone on the left, they come through in political forms that are abhorrent. Yeah. So we attack those political forms, but we don't address what they're doing, which is actually meeting people with where they are and dealing with those feelings. But those feelings don't have to end up where the reactionary right has led them. Yeah. It seems so clear in retrospect that 2008... Obama winning, I think, was a sort of sigh of relief or an expression of happiness for a lot of people on the left. And they kind of ignored all of those voices that became louder and louder in the next four to eight years. And I think especially the next election victory, the second election victory of Obama, also placated people thinking like, well, there are these Tea Party people or whatever, but they're they're not significant enough to worry about. Right. Yeah. And so in retrospect, you can look back, you can see this like fervent racism building in 2008 and all these things that coalesce in a way to lead to Trump's victory. And we can unpack that looking back. You said you weren't necessarily surprised when Trump won. And I think that stands out. I mean, I think a lot of people were surprised, both on the left and the right. What lessons, if any, can you take from that experience moving forward so that we're not just kind of retrospectively thinking like, oh, yeah, that's why we lost. That's why we lost. But is there anything that you see as, a, as the most valuable take to move forward in going into the future? Well, can I back up a moment? Yeah, of course. I just set the stage for what I think is new and um, what happens in 2007 and eight, and that Trump becomes an extraordinary crystallization. I mean, uh -huh. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't uh, think it's all about Trump. And I don't think if and when we defeat Trump, that, I mean, it, it would be nice to defeat Trump and we should and we need to work for it. But then the battle just begins. Mm -hmm. I tried to argue and I argue in the book that if you look at the second half of the 20th century, it is characterized by struggles between three large heterogeneous political formations. One is the liberal democratic hegemony, you know, uh, American post-war liberalism mm -hmm. that claimed that it had established itself as the true and best model um, of what human civilization should look like. You know, given very explicit articulation in Fukuyama's The Last Man, The End of History. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the war was over, you know, by the 1950s, that notion of the dominant hegemony of liberal capitalist democracy came under attack. It came under attack from the left, all sorts of left groups, anti-war, civil rights, feminists, countercultural. And it also came under attack from the right who argued that the big state, the expansion of state powers in the name of economic and social justice made America more and more into a communist country. Now, that was absurd. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't think they actually thought this was communism, but it was a wonderful rhetorical strategy. They began to attack the big state and 
part of the whole project of the new right was to minimize the state right, in the name of nationalism and liberty. Yeah. The state became the enemy of the individual. So we had to make it smaller. So you had this battle that really was a battle over, I put it this way, it was a battle over what does it mean to be modern, fought partly as a battle over what modern governance is, and partly over, as a battle over what modern culture is. And remember, you know, the new right was arguing about um, the great books and the canon and you know, there were all attacks on popular culture, Alan Bloom's yeah. closing of the American mind and all the attacks on the PC culture of the university were all about what a modern culture should look like. And of course, the left was also arguing about what a modern culture should look like. Yeah. It's attacks on the canons, it's attacks on the elitism of high art, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a struggle, I think, over how we are going to be modern. Something changes with the new millennium. And it's partly a cultural phenomenon that people have described as postmodernism, and I've described in you know, books and in, in the development of a kind of postmodern affective sensibility. It's partly also the increasing visibility that the state cannot solve the problems that we face. Yeah. Now, there are lots of reasons why it can't solve them. They're very complex. They're all interwoven. And, of course, the right understood the strategic value of obstructionism. That is, they didn't want the state to be able to solve the problems. Yeah, yeah. Because that just means people divorce themselves from the state. And people see themselves increasingly as the victims of the state. Right? They don't see the state as helping them. They see the state as failing them. That notion of a struggle over what it will mean to be modern is a version of what Gramsci called an organic crisis. Mm -hmm. An attempt to bring all the different contradictory crises and, and determinations of a society together and say, our identity is in question. We no longer know who we are and how to move forward. And this, for the last half of the 20th century, was an argument about what it means to be modern. I think what begins to happen and what becomes very explicit with the rise of the reactionary right is the emergence of a different organic crisis. And that organic crisis is, we don't want to be modern. When Steve Bannon and, and other reactionary thinkers talks about tearing down the state, what he's saying is modern forms of governance are no longer relevant. Now, the turn to traditionalist philosophies, Ganon and others, Dugan, hmm. The return to the paleoconservatives, the traditionalists, all of these people, all of these kind of political positions are basically saying, and if you read some of the intellectual journals of what we glibly call, and I'm doing it, the reactionary right, parentheses, there are intellectual, hmm. very smart people who have serious discussions and serious debates about everything from whether they should support Trump to, you know, how they should address questions of race or poverty or environment, mm -hmm. those people are actually suggesting that modernity, and for many of them, that means the Enlightenment, has failed. It has failed politically, it has failed economically, and it has failed culturally. So we have one kind of crisis that we're struggling over, which is about the forms of modern governance. And we have a second crisis that we're suddenly struggling over, which is whether or not modern governance is even worth fighting for. Now, although I'm assigning that to at least fractions of the reactionary right, because I'll come to the, the chaos in a moment, the complexity, realize that although fractions and significant fractions, not all, 
but many of them are really saying the project of modernity has failed, the project of the Enlightenment. So progress, equality, all the fundamental virtues and all the fundamental institutions that were introduced in the 18th century in Europe in a variety of different forms of modernity mm -hmm. have failed. And what we need is to reinvent either a pre-modern society, what some people would call an alter-modern society, or a post-modern society. Now, the interesting thing is, at that moment, you know, in order for an organic crisis to take shape, it can't just be one political position that argues for the crisis. Now, if you think about it, there are serious fractions of the left which have basically renounced modernity and enlightenment. And there are technological, I'm not sure what to call them, because they're not utopians and they're not dystopians. I mean, they're kind of technological postmodernists, yeah. you know, who imagine a kind of non-modern existence, right? I mean, all those people now who talk about phrase au jour is individuality. We're not individuals anymore. Mm. We're individuals. So we have pre-individual and post-individual relationships. I don't know if I agree with them or not, but that's a fundamental challenge to the logics, structures, organizations, values that organized European modernities. So the crisis is being redefined. I mean, some of the work, again, not all of it, but some of the work in decoloniality, some of the kind of prefigurative politics that has come back from the late 19th and mid 20th century, mm -hmm. that has come back. That stuff is old. You know, I mean, you think that some of these people who are talking about anarchist collectives and prefigurative politics don't realize that it has its roots in the late 19th century. People have been talking about these things. But again, the old enters into a new context in which there are some new relations and it takes on a different set of effects and resonances yeah. so that it becomes, I think, a second organic crisis. Now, you put together a situation in which there are multiple struggles going on in, as it were, two political discursive universes, but they overlap. The reactionaries who support Trump, there are a lot of reactionary rights who don't support Trump, but the ones who do support Trump, including Bannon, you know, that is, it, and he did, you know, they argue that we can take over the state in order to destroy the state. Yeah. So they're still, in a way, willing to operate with the first organic crisis in order to solve the second organic crisis. Wow. Right? Yeah. But they don't want to minimize the state. Bannon doesn't want to minimize the state in the way Reagan did. This is why, for them, Reagan is not a hero. They want to destroy the state because the state is a failed project of European modernities. So there is an almost chaotic heterogeneity and complexity yeah. to the political field that we have not been able to sort out. Now, you add to that what I see as chaos of the cultural field. Yeah. Simply in the multiplicities on offer. You know, I, I remember when I used to, when I was writing about popular culture and, you know, I was trying to watch as much as I could and listen to as much as I could. But I would always get that horrifying phone call from someone who said, did you just see that program? Mm -hmm. And I would say, no. And they said, well, you had to have seen it because it was the proof of your point or it was the disproof of your point. But that doesn't happen anymore because there's so much yeah. that no one can possibly figure out the terrain. There's so much music. Now, how can one talk about popular music today? Yeah. I mean, there is so much and it's so diverse. Much of it is wonderful. Much of it is terrible. There is a kind of chaos. And, of course, social media yeah. is a great technology for amplifying chaos. And I think understanding Trump and what's going on today is understanding how one operates politics under conditions of chaos.
Yeah, I think your book is perfectly named. People have said this. I mean, even you can go back to the Hayek and his colleagues. They argued that one needed to mess up, confuse, create chaos in the epistemic field. Just put out lots of information. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. You just want people to be confused. You want to create chaos. I think you know, they weren't very successful at it, but now we are. Yeah. Definitely. Right? And I think Bannon has said the same thing. It isn't about the news or ideas. It's about flooding the public realm so that you produce chaos. And the reactionary right, you know, someone like William Buckley or Russell Kirk, who were the heroes, intellectual heroes of the new right, they would have despised the idea of chaos. Mm -hmm. Like conservatives are supposed to like order. Yeah. Chaos is not conservatism. Chaos is something new. And I think the, the reactionary right has learned how to weaponize chaos and how to survive and organize politics under conditions of chaos. And I think the left hasn't begun to raise the question. So, you know, what can we take away? Well, I mean, I, I'm a great believer. It's sort of the, the premise of my book where we started. I believe that if you want to change the world, you better understand what the world is. Yeah. If you want to develop strategies for change, you have to know what's going on first. And not assume that the strategies of the past, which get reborn as if they were new. I mean, much of what the left is doing, and my students, for example, are doing, and in some cases, my colleagues, they actually think that these tactics are new. Hmm. Not to say, you know, they have a long history. It's not to say that in the present context, again, they may not have different implications, but the kind of appeal to experience, the appeal to um, the authority of experience, to more or less essentialized identities, to symbolic politics, to disruptive politics. These are all old strategies which have been criticized and discussed over the years mm -hmm. and seem to me not very effective strategies for the present context in which we're fighting. Trump's success is that he is a master of chaos. That's what he does. I don't think the content of what he does matters except insofar as he operates sort of as a continuation of the new right. So he throws bones to fractions of the new right, the anti-abortion movement, you know, the religious right, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I think his real power is that he produces chaos and he functions politically as if chaos were his natural environment. Yeah. I don't know how you respond to that because I don't know that the left can function that way, but it has to find a way to operate in the chaos against the chaos in order to move people out of the chaos into a different position. And that means you have to understand what people are feeling and why people would think living in the chaos. Chaos is the absolute antinomy of modernity, right? Modernity is about the organization of chaos. Yeah. This is the refusal to organize chaos. This is what Hannah Arendt, I think, was called systemless systems. I, I mean, it's the creation of a reality in which you don't manage chaos, but you produce the chaos. And you take the chaos that is there in politics and culture especially, but also in social relations, you take that as the given context and figure out how to operate on that terrain. Yeah. That, I think, is new. I don't know if it's happened in the past. I mean, I'm not a historian, so it may be in other cultures or in other moments of the past. There have been these kinds of transitional moments. I think it is one of those moments that Hegel and Gramsci described where the old cannot die and the new cannot yet be born. And those transitional moments. There's a second part to that Gramsci quote where it, the morbid symptoms. He says in these moments of transition, which in a way are moments of chaos, because no order, no structure can hold, 
he describes the results as uh, the morbid symptom that emerged from this chaos. Yeah. And I think that's that's a good description of what we're living through in the United States. Yeah. I mean, there's a sort of two-part question I really want to ask you in relation to that. Sure. So in this book, you talk about sort of clearly inspired by Stuart Hall and the cultural studies tradition of finding this conjuncture of different elements and explaining them, which in this case is especially hard. can't even imagine how you started, which is why I want to ask you about it, because it seems like we're dealing with chaos. And so one thing that you've done is break down the chaos that we're seeing into more manageable ways of understanding it. So there's that issue, and I'm curious about how you even go about doing that, and if you have advice for people who might want to do a somewhat similar reading, maybe not of of this, but of something, maybe it's something that will happen in the future, or something that is something that's different than the the conjuncture you're specifically studying. But I also want to ask you, since you are building on this cultural studies tradition, which kind of does away with this idea of cultural dupes and wants to ask, you know, why are people doing this? What is it? Rather than just assuming that people involved in popular culture are stupid. Let's ask what they're doing and find out more. That always made sense to me, and I always loved that. I mean, I'm a student of popular culture. But at the same time, at this moment in history, in the political context, seeing people online sure that Obama is a is a gay Muslim man who has never born in America and just so confident with that, right? It's not that that person or that group of people who believe that kind of thing are the sole responsible, but that huge contingency of people in part helped elect Trump because of these conspiracies, because of these things that have no bearing on reality whatsoever. I don't know. To me, I'm just very tempted to actually do away with that idea and think like, no, no, there can be cultural dupes. These are what cultural dupes look like. <laughs> so I'm just curious about how you went about looking at this chaos, right. breaking it down a little bit into the conjunctures that you set up, and maybe if if you could say a little bit about whether or not you think that um, that there are or may be cultural dupes, or maybe that is, I mean, I'm not saying we need to use that term, but this idea of like sort of asking people, what, what are your uses and gratifications, right? What are you getting out of this? And why is that an important element of your, your life? I don't know. Do we need to accept that people are getting uses and gratification out of thinking Obama is a secretly gay Muslim man who is... Uh, from Kenya and all this stuff? Or can we just say like, no, these people actually are stupid? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> first, uh, those are great questions. Um, I wish I could answer them. <laughs> um, cultural studies in the you know, tradition that I represent, which as you say, comes out of originally my training out of Britain, Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, mm -hmm. but exists almost everywhere in the world, much more so than the United States. Cultural studies, as you just described it, is a very minor political intellectual formation in the United States. There are lots of people who just say they do cultural studies, mm. and what they mean is the politics of culture. You know, they read ideologies off texts, or they talk about uh, uh, feminist critiques or post-colonial critiques. And I don't think that's cultural studies, in, in my sense, because cultural studies is about complexity and context. Right? And that's part of what I want to come to in your question, the second half. Um, cultural studies does not say there are not dopes and there are not dupes, or that people aren't duped sometimes. Many of us very intelligent people probably have been duped at various times. Mm -hmm. Some of us were sort of duped by Obama. Mm. Whom we sort of ended up treating like he was the great savior because he was smart and well-spoken. And while he did some very good and important things, he also had lots of policies that were not very good. And we probably were duped to think he was going to be the savior of the country. People are duped. People do believe false things because the media tell them, because their teachers tell them, because their families tell them, because whatever. Mm -hmm. Cultural studies just says if you want to organize political change, you can't start with the assumption that people are duped and or are dopes. Maybe your conclusion, but it can't be your assumption. Mm. right? And there's a big difference there. Now, one of the early models that was developed out of 
Birmingham, Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, where Stuart Hall was the director for a decade, was this so-called encoding-decoding model, which was one of the impulses for an increasing emphasis on audience studies. Uses and gratifications came out of a different tradition, but it too looked to audience studies. Mm -hmm. There were works in literature around notions of reading communities that similarly, you know, Jan Radway's yeah. work on reading the romance, Jan didn't come out of a cultural studies tradition. She just ended up in that. <laughs> but the impetus for her was from different intellectual sources. You don't find, I think, many people centrally involved in cultural studies who would advocate audience studies as a fruitful way to get at the answers to the questions you're raising. For example, you know, perhaps the most famous figure out of cultural studies to study audiences was Dave Morley. Mm -hmm. Dave doesn't do that anymore because of the complexity of audiences, the size of audiences by itself, uh, the contradictions that operate as you try to work your way through this because of the dilemmas that anthropologists and others have articulated in the practices of ethnographic research itself for all sorts of reasons. You know, people in cultural studies, at least, have sought to find other ways of getting at those questions. Questions like, why do people buy into conspiracy theories? I don't have the answer to that. But I think they tend, you know, one tends to think uh, in cultural studies, that the answer in part has to start by recognizing the complexity and contextuality of whatever it is that you're trying to understand, and in part understand that what makes us cultural studies is that we study culture. So we're going to find the answer to whatever extent we can by considering the complexities and articulations and relations within the discursive universes that people live in. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was trained in, among other things, when I got my PhD in communication, I had to study uses and gratifications. And you know, like many things, I think there's a bit of truth in it. I mean, it is reasonable to ask, although... You know, I don't think uses and gratifications theory was an adequate yeah. response, but it is useful to ask, what are people getting from these things? What is it doing for them? What is its operation? How does it fit into their lives? How does it connect and articulate to the fears, hopes, agonies that they feel in their lives? So, you know, understanding the birther conspiracy I mean, yes, I'm sure it's part racism, but it's more than racism. And if we say to those people, well, you're just racist, mm -hmm. we've just lost some part of the population. Maybe we want to lose them, and you know, maybe we can't win them over. But if you go around and say to people, you're racist, they're not going to listen to the next sentence you say. Yeah. So, yes, it's racism, but it's more, and it's contradictory. And it has to be understood in the context of all sorts of other things that are going on, which leads to your second question. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you do this? Yeah. And I've been trying to figure that one out for 45 years. Yeah. You know, I can tell you a bit of the answer, of my answer, at least. In cultural studies and other positions, and, and by the way, you know, this commitment to context and complexity is not unique to cultural studies. Mm -hmm. And there are economists, critical economists, like J.K. Gibson Graham, that I think have a commitment for their first book, um, uh, The End of Capitalism as We Know It, you know, or Wendy Brown's work that has a commitment to complexity and contextuality that makes them sympathetic allies, epistemic allies, although they may not focus on questions of culture in the way we do. And they may not operate with the notion of a conjuncture. So the notion of a conjuncture, which has a long and sloppy history in Marxist theory, is taken up in cultural studies 
as the first part of a solution to your question in that it suggests a certain level of abstraction. If you try to explain Trump's victory, I think you will be overwhelmed by the complexity of the issue. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It is so overdetermined. There are so many different audiences and different reasons and different relations, and they vary from place to place and different histories. That if you actually tried to say, here's why Trump won, you couldn't do yeah. it. Maybe if you took 20 years and you were a kind of archivalist, then you could do it. But it, it doesn't solve the political intellectual problems that cultural studies wants to pose. On the other hand, if you think about the great tendential forces, like the role of religion and capitalism and the environmental struggle, these things have gone on for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. The environmental and climate catastrophes that we're facing mm -hmm. have their roots back in industrialization, although they have accelerated greatly uh, in the 20th century. These are what Gramsci sometimes called the organic forces, the tendential forces. These are epochal changes. They are what Foucault describes. Foucault is an interesting figure. Because he's sort of like cultural studies in that I think he is, uh, recognizes complexity and recognizes contextuality. But he thinks in epochal terms, mm -hmm. discipline, uh, securitization. These are things that span centuries. Yeah. And that's good. But, you know, part of the problem with Marxism or some forms of Marxism is that it thinks it's dealing with a conjuncture when it's dealing with an epoch. Mm. We've been trying to overthrow capitalism for a long time, treating it as if it were a conjunctural problem rather than an epochal problem that has effects and resonances and determinations in a conjuncture. So the conjuncture is sort of a compromised position. It says it's not as abstract as epochs, and it's not as overdetermined as the actual event, Trump's election. Mm -hmm. It operates in terms of the struggles that define decades is a conjunctural struggle. Modernity is an epochal issue. Mm -hmm. And that's what's part of what's so interesting with the rise of a new organic crisis over the very desirability of modernity itself because that's making an epochal politics into an organic crisis. So now we have the conjuncture, because it seems like a useful level at which I can have something to say as an intellectual and perhaps say things that will enable people to begin to think strategically and tactically about how to change the conjuncture. The difficulty of talking about how to change the epoch mm -hmm. is beyond my ability. And the difficulty of talking about how to elect a candidate is beyond my capacity. But I can talk about these kind of struggles that have taken place over decades and have transformed the political culture and continue to do so. And then what you have to do is somehow recognize that what one is looking at are struggles over the creation of relationships between the various elements within the social formation. The relations of economics, between economics and politics, within culture, between culture and economics, etc. So you have a field of enormous complexity and a field that is full of contradictions. But you can, I think, you can ask yourself, where can I break into that conjuncture? Where is there a point of struggle where I think I can then follow the lines of what you know, Stuart Hall called articulation, follow Ramsey McLeod, mm -hmm. that will open up the conjuncture to me. I mean, obviously, my book is a gamble that Trump's election, I'm not really interested in that book in explaining Trump's election, mm -hmm. interested in using it as a way into the conjunction. 
but in a particular cultural studies way, which is not to see it as a metonym, not to think that it is the world in a grain of sand, that I can read off of Trump everything, yeah. but to see it as an opening, and I can begin to follow some of the lines. I didn't follow all of them. You know, I didn't follow the economic lines. I have students who are following the economic lines to begin to argue, for example, that neoliberalism is insufficient as an understanding of contemporary capitalism in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And that if you look at Trump and his relation to capitalism, if you follow the lines, it leads you into a history of corporatism and the power of the corporation rather than the power of the free market. Trump isn't a free marketer. Mm -hmm. Trump isn't a neoliberal. And it's not very clear that, you know, the new right were neoliberals. I mean, the Chicago School of Economics may have been neoliberals, but they didn't control the new right. The new right's economics was full of contradictions. Yeah. So you can begin to follow the lines. You know, the most famous example of cultural studies is, I'm sure you know, a book called Policing the Crisis, yeah. in which a group of people, friends of mine, Stuart Hall, John Clark, others, took an event. The event was a mugging mm -hmm. of a white man by a group of young Brits, some of them immigrants. The kids were found guilty and given enormous sentences, yeah. much greater than one thought the crime would have got. They thought, this is interesting. Why is this happening? And that led them to, okay, where does this discourse of mugging come? Because when they started to look, mm -hmm. they found people claiming that this was a new crime. Yeah. There was no evidence that it was a new crime. Yeah. They found people claiming it was imported from America. Yeah. There was no evidence that it was imported, right? So they began to look at how mugging was yeah. constructed. And it's not even a crime, right? Like there's no nothing in the books that says mugging is a crime. Right. It's, it's yeah, assault it's or it's uh, robbery. Right. And what they found, right? following some of the lines of articulation, they ended up, you know, in what is one of the great moments, in my opinion, of intellectual work. Mm -hmm. They ended up basically predicting the rise of that. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. They said, look, what we're seeing here is a, the emergence of a complex cultural, political, economic, and social discourse, a new formation. And it looks like it's, occupying the leading ground in the conservative party. Mm -hmm. And this is dangerous, right? Hall eventually called it authoritarian populism, adjusting it from Nikos Polansis' hmm. work. Now, when I asked Stuart and John Clark, one of my closest friends, did you have any idea that this mugging and this particular event was going to open up the conjuncture in the way it did. They said, no, we didn't. We just took a gamble. We thought, this is interesting. Maybe it will tell us something. It won't tell us everything. It won't be the complete story of the conjuncture. But maybe it will tell us something interesting about what's going on. And of course, they were right. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's how you operate. You operate by saying, this is an interesting event. Uh, you know, Raymond Williams famously said when he was asked to define cultural studies, he said it's the study of all the relations amongst all the elements in the whole way of life. Yeah, that's a little intimidating. No one has ever done that. <laughs> and you would be crazy if you thought you could. But his idea was, but that's what you would have to do to get a full conjunctural story. Mm -hmm. And you can contribute pieces to that. I mean, I remember when I was researching one of my books, the vice president of the Heritage Foundation said that they were worried because the left actually had the biggest think tank ever existing on the history of the planet. And if the left ever actually used it, they would be decimated. And what he meant was the university system. Mm. But we don't work together. That's true. Cultural studies bleeds in collaboration precisely because the terrain is always more complicated, complex, contextual, contradictory than any one person can do. Because you can't see it all. Right? So I can say this is happening and then 
John Clark says, yes, but this is also happening. So how do these two articulate? Right? Yeah. That's why it's collaborative. And then the collaboration can get bigger. You know, by the time we actually get big enough, uh, the world will have changed so much that we have to start over. <laughs> right? But it's a project. Mm -hmm. right? It's a project to say, I think, we need better stories. We need better accounts of what's going on. I tell this story in one of my earlier books. I actually went, went to hear William Buckley who was one of the God figures of the New Rock. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said was, he, he was explaining why he didn't support Barry Goldwater and why he thought Barry Goldwater had lost in 1964. Mm -hmm. And he said he didn't support him because he didn't think that the conservatives had done the work on the culture of America that would prepare the ground for a conservative victory. Mm -hmm. And why they lost, why they hadn't done that work is, he said, because we actually don't understand contemporary America well enough to create the sort of revolution that we're trying to create. Yeah, And that's the point at which all these think tanks, like the Heritage, were created to do that work, to do the serious research of trying to understand some of it's very good and some of it's so overdetermined by their politics as to be useless. Yeah. But the same can be said of lots of work on the left. Mm -hmm. But that's what they tried to do. They tried to understand the United States. And in my judgment, judging by their success, they've done a better job of it than the left has, of understanding the conditions and possibility within which they're working, the complexity, the contradictions, and developing <laughs> tactics and strategies that will enable them to move the country in the directions that they want to move. Hmm. Uh, and I think anyone who fairly looks at it has to conclude that they have been winning. Yeah. That the direction of American society, politics, economics, and culture, culture is more contradictory, as it always is, uh, has not been in the directions that the left would prefer. Yeah. Theories, strategies, tactics of the left have not only been not effective, but have often produced results that are contrary to the very desires of the left. That is, you know, I think part of the question, which we haven't talked about, and you know, I, I wrote a book about this, is we have to ask why the left has failed. We not only have to ask why the right has succeeded. Yeah, that's true. We have to ask why the left has failed. What is it about its, its theories, its understandings, its tactics and strategies that have not enabled it, despite evidence that there is some support for at least a more liberal agenda than you know, the direction that the U.S. has been moving in, yeah. why has it not been able to organize that politics? I think that's the other half of the question, yeah. which this book doesn't really address. But the book before it, which was called We All Want to Change the World, yeah, yeah, yeah. is all why the left has not been successful. Yeah. I mean, Larry, you've been so generous with your time, and I don't want to take up too much more of it. But I want to ask you, uh, as a final sort of question, building on what you've just said, what is it that you want to see, maybe in some of your own research, but maybe in research by others? What, what needs to be done, really? And what are you hoping that you and others will be able to contribute to some of the questions that, I mean, we've talked about, but maybe that we haven't talked about? In the near future, what are you hoping to see? I would like to see much more much more collaborative effort on the part of progressive intellectuals working together. If you look at how much has been written about Trump since his election, mm -hmm. it's extraordinary. No one could read it all. I mean, I have a file with somewhere around 2,000 articles and essays and about 100 books. Wow. And those are only the ones I could download economically affordable, shall we say. <laughs> yeah. How can anyone read it? Yeah. And the point is, why would anyone read it? Because most of it is either simple-minded or completely redundant or so fragmented. It's all about this and nothing else. It doesn't help you in any way. We need to find 
forms of collaboration and forms, I mean, it needs us to rethink the nature of academic and intellectual work of the modern age, perhaps removing some of the pressure to publish and putting more pressure on actually publishing something worth publishing. Yeah. Part of the way that I think that might be done is I would like to see the establishment of some real intellectual think tanks on the left where collaborative and self-critical, where you could criticize each other, where you could say that's stupid and still know that you're working together on a common project, where you could do research together, where you have a variety of empirical methodologies on play as you ask a particular question that is a piece of the larger puzzle of a conjunctural analysis. I think we need think tanks. Because I think the university is never going to do that. Hmm. And that may happen if we could ever get some billionaire to just say, well, let's create a think tank yeah. like that or something. I would like to see a journal of intelligent, critical thinking. Like many of us, I subscribe to you know, lots of left wing journalist magazines and newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I find them mostly useless. They tell me things I already know. They tell me what it's like to live in the conditions like you know, the prison. I mean, I know the prison system is abhorrent. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I gain a lot by gaining ever more detail or reading the experience. It might be interesting and I continue to read it. Yeah. They tell me that so-and-so in a particular town is doing this wonderful thing, this struggle, leading this struggle, creating this alternative, et cetera, et cetera. They never tell me a year later whether it's still working. Hmm. I mean, the odd thing is there is more intellectual discussion and disagreement on the right than there is on the left. The right understands the value of this. Now, there are elements of the right that obviously are completely anti-intellectual. Yeah. There are elements of the left that I think of as completely anti-intellectual. But there are significant key elements of the right, and there are journals on the right that stage arguments and disagreements and have contentious conversations within a shared common ground. I would like to see a journal. You know, I, I don't mean to sound nostalgic, but... You know, things like the partisan review where people could argue, mm -hmm. people could disagree and not be accused of being a racist or being, you know, a capitalist stool because they disagreed with the normative line or something. Yeah. You know, it's my dream when I retire is that someone will give me a couple of million dollars <laughs> and I'd start that journal. Yeah. I mean, I don't know enough about a lot of issues where the expertise of various people coming together and the disagreements amongst those people, I would like to see them played out. You know, I don't need presidential candidates arguing with each other about which policy is better. I need people who actually know something yeah. to argue it out for me to decide how to move forward. And that would lead me to the third thing that I would like to see, which I don't I even less optimistic about. I would like to see some context in which the left could actually, the political left, could actually criticize itself, in which one could walk into contentious, passionate political struggles and argue about whether that analysis is right and whether that strategy or tactics is the best one. And I'll give you an example, which will probably you know, get me in trouble. But I've got a piece coming out sometime soon that will do this anyway. You know, at, at UNC, we, we have gone through a two-year struggle over a Confederate statue, mm -hmm. Silent Sam, which was eventually pulled down by the student protesters. I, I supported the students insofar as I felt moved to do so. Mm -hmm. I did not oppose them. I, I had some of my students involved in it. But I would have liked to have been able to have an argument about that over the nature of commemoration 
and public memory, over the value of symbolic politics, over the politics based on individual experiences of being hurt. You know, mm-hmm. the argument, and we find it all over the place now on the left, is people say, this is bad because I feel hurt by it. Mm-hmm. My inclination is to think that's not a good basis for politics. But I'm willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to have an intelligent conversation about it, but I can't. No one wants to have that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I would like to have a conversation about what the assumptions that are being made in struggles like that about the nature of race and racism and the nature of privilege. I don't know. I mean, I'll come in with my opinions. My opinions could be wrong. Mm -hmm. For me, the fundamental commitment of cultural studies is that it is opposed to certainty. If you think you know something with absolute certainty, then that's a problem for me. I think we should always be willing to enter into conversation where we might find out that we are not right. The... um, Native American poet philosopher John Trudell was one of the founders of the American Indian movement back in the 60s. He has this idea that I love. He contrasts believing and thinking. He says believing is certainty. Believing puts you in a box because you're certain and nothing from the outside can challenge you, can disrupt you. Mm -hmm. And the only face you can put forward to the outside is the face of the box of certainty. But he says thinking is very different. Thinking is about the flow of energy. Thinking is about change. I would like a context in which I thought the left could do more thinking and less believing. Find a way in which we could argue with each other and not be accused of either being complicitous with the enemy or, you know, were I, were I to take up the issue of silent salmon race, being accused of implicit racism. Mm-hmm. I mean, I may be, I'm, I may have implicit racism. I don't deny that, you know, see, I don't think of myself as white, so I can't say white, but I don't deny that people growing up in the United States, uh, are raised in a racist society. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that every time I disagree with someone is because I'm a racist or because I'm speaking from a position of privilege. I mean, I have lots of positions of privilege. Some of them I think I've earned over the course of 50 years. Some of them are unearned. You know, I was born into a middle class family. I had the you know, the luxury of being able to go to university, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are privileges. I was also Jewish and got beat up and called names mm-hmm. because of being a Jew. I was also disabled. Those are positions not a privilege. This is the complexity of every individual. Yeah. I'd like to be able to have this conversation and say privilege is too simple a concept to think with without getting accused of, you know, you can only say that because you're speaking with white privilege, yeah, yeah. which I say, I'm not white. You know, when my grandparents came to this country, they were called black because they were Jewish. Hmm. Right? These are much more complex struggles around identity and differences that we have to take account of. I'd like to be able to have these discussions as an intellectual and, and as a political advocate, if, at least. Yeah. I don't know how to have them. I don't know where they're taking place. I mean, I'm enough of an optimist to think that they, they're probably taking place like locally in people's houses hmm. over a couple of beers with a couple of joints or whatever. People have these arguments. Maybe. I'd like to hope so. I have them with friends. Yeah. But I don't see them on the national stage. Yeah. I don't see them shaping policy. I don't see an argument, you know, about, you know, you brought up earlier. What kind of unity does the left need to create in order to mobilize effectively? Too many people are too, every time I talk about the left in public, someone says there is no such thing Mm -hmm. as the left. And I say, well, look, there never was. I mean, 
you have some illusion that somewhere in the past there was this homogeneous position called the left where Trotskyites and Leninites and Stalinists and anarchists all somehow agreed? Yeah, yeah. Where was this unified left? The left was always a managed chaos, as it is today. Only today, we don't want to manage it. Yeah. We don't want to create a unity in difference. We just want to celebrate difference. And I think that's partly why we're losing, because as you said, the right is much better at creating a sense of unity mm -hmm. that enables it to work despite their disagreements. And some of them are very profound. You know, as I said before, I mean, imagine Jerry Falwell, who advocated, you know, who thought prostitution and abortion and drugs and everything should be illegal because it was immoral sitting down at the same table with Milton Friedman, who thought everything should be legal mm. because it should be marketized. And yet, they joined forces to elect Ronald Reagan. Hmm. I mean, I have to say, though, on a smaller scale, because, yes, we don't see this in sort of mainstream media the way that it, it would be so beneficial to see, but your work, your publications, and your scholarship, and also your willingness to speak to somebody like me that... You know, you don't have to by any means. Your willingness to talk to me for almost two hours about these kinds of ideas, I think, is a great demonstration of how that could work on a larger scale if more people were willing to engage like that. And I just want to thank you very much, Larry, for, for talking to me today about your work and about these ideas. My pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. You are welcome. And, you know, I'm, I, I love talking. <laughs> and I think these issues matter. Yeah. I think definitely. And I believe intellectual and political work is pedagogical. Yeah. Pedagogy is a conversation. Yeah. You know, I'll end with one, maybe, I can keep going <laughs> forever. Stuart Hall used to say, look, when you're teaching, you go into a class one day and you teach some theory or some event, you know, something, and you teach it with the passion and certainty that you are right. Except that you have to realize that you may come in the next day and start the lecture by saying, remember what I said yesterday? Well, I was wrong. Mm. Because you read something new, someone spoke to you, something happened. Right? You speak with passion, defending your position, but always knowing that there is no guarantee that your position is right. In fact, in anything, there's always going to be a guarantee that your position has to change as complexity and contradiction enters and as the world changes, as other people educate you, I think we forget too often that we're educators. Yeah. That that's what the role of an intellectual is. And that education is always being open to being wrong. And I think that's the fundamental commitment of an intellectual, is I could be wrong. Yeah. If we just started there, we'd be a lot better off. Yeah. Well, like I said, you are a wonderful model throughout your work of just this kind of approach to intellectual and pedagogical engagement. And I, I just really am pleased that I was able to speak with you today about this stuff. I appreciate the opportunity and keep doing what you're doing because we need all the fora for some kind of communication we can get. Yeah. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. I really do appreciate it. And if you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do is spread the word. Social media, whatever app you're using, if you can give it a thumbs up or a like or a happy face or whatever the cool emoji is, I really do appreciate that. Also, be sure to check out the website, tinapp.org. Larry's provided some really thoughtful reading recommendations, and everyone should check those things out. I know the books that I hadn't read that he recommended, I pretty much ordered right away. It's wonderful to be able to talk to someone like Lawrence Grossberg like this. I look forward to sharing more interviews with you. I'm Chris, signing off. Cheers. Cheers.